All right, guys, thank you for coming to the 2019 BCS Classic. Uh, as you know, because you're here, we added a faith and a family component to the event this year. So part of that is a speaker lineup. And I asked Stephanie and Ashley to be one of our speakers because these women are incredibly inspirational. They started a conference that maybe you're familiar with, uh, but it's called the UR Conference, and it's a women's conference. And women, you know, it gets nearly 1,500 plus women to come out for a Friday night and a Saturday, you know, we'll, uh, we'll say like a conference for ladies. <laughs> and my wife has been uh, a few times and she comes back so encouraged and inspired and just shares with me what that experience is like. And I fully believe in having opportunities to do that. And so what I asked them is I wanted to give y'all like a... a opportunity to have that for uh, one session and so we have people on video and we have Facebook live going so you know my hope and my prayer is that these two ladies speak into your life today and that they inspire you and encourage you uh, to realize what God has in store for you so Ashley Stephanie thank y'all so thank much you, and enjoy hey well, thank you. It really is such an honor to get to do this first round, really, of Charlie's big vision of combining this family, faith, and fitness. And I, I, I just can't get behind it more. I love it. I love the whole person. And I love that because that's God's heart, and it always has been from the, whole, from the very beginning. And so that's what we really want to talk about. Um, Ash and I, well, we're both going to share a little bit, just our personal journey with the Lord, and then we're going to talk together a little bit about who God is and 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 how he really wants to demonstrate his dreams through each one of our lives and how he created that. So if you guys are, um, if you guys are right with it, I'm going to start with prayer and then we'll go from there, okay? So Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this chance to come together as a community of people, God, that, um, that we just get to pause and to remember who you really are and how you really love to communicate with your people. God, I pray that in this time that you would do more than we even know how to ask or imagine, that you would translate our human language into spiritual language and that we would be able to hear your voice, Lord, and that we would be changed by our time together. God, we thank you, we look to you, we honor you, and we ask that you glorify yourself in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to start just by saying, um, you know, I grew up in, uh, the, in Houston area, so Cyprus, and then we also, and then uh, the Woodlands area. And, and I grew up around lots of different kinds of people from lots of different church backgrounds. My family, my immediate family, wasn't uniquely spiritual. We'd go to church, you know, Christmas, Easter, those kinds of things, but we weren't, we weren't uniquely Christian. Um, but I would go and I would get to experience church life with lots of different friends, um, lots of different church backgrounds, denominations, all the different kinds of things. Um, I, one of my, my duet partners actually was uh, a, a very devout and charismatic Catholic, and she would always ask me in middle school, we were duet partners, dance duet partners in middle school, and she would always ask me, if you were to die while you were sleeping, do you know if you go to heaven? And I'm like, stop, Melissa, like, you let me just go to sleep, you know, like, I just were here having fun. So anyway, um, but through that experience, my mind started going like, I, I want to be safe from hell. That was kind of it. That's what I understood. I wasn't like, I want to know Jesus. It was more like, I want to be good to go. I want to live my life and I don't want to be afraid of hell. That was really what my journey at the beginning was like. And so I went to my pastor at the time and said, hey, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to, I, don't, I, want, I want to be free from, from uh from being afraid. So he's like, well, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross? Yeah, sure, you know, and I didn't know anything else. I'm like, yeah, that sounds right, you know, and, and so really that journey kind of confused me for a little while, because I thought, well, I, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I didn't really know God, and that's what, what, I, what I'd love to just share a little bit about the difference. So it wasn't until, and, and I was around a lot of people that did talk to him, that they, would, that they would love to read his word, and as they would read his word, like, it was like they got filled up with life and joy, and I didn't experience that. In fact, I actually, the, from that moment that I had that encounter in eighth grade of, okay, I'm gonna, I just wanna kinda be safe, you know, I actually enjoyed sinning more. 
You know, I mean, I really did. It was almost like I'm gonna, I had this rebellion in my heart that I didn't know what to do with, do with or even deal with. And so I, I, I felt like bad around my church friends that I liked sinning. I liked doing the party scene. I liked stuff that I was doing with my boyfriends. I liked that. But then I kind of feel guilty because these other church friends didn't seem to like that or thought that was really bad. So I really began living a double life. I was really churchy and I was really, you know, party girl in, in a long time, you know. So there were years of that. And it wasn't until I was in college. I was a sophomore in college. And, um, and I, I had sort of accomplished everything at that point that, I, that my heart wanted to accomplish. At that age, I was very successful in dance. I'd gone to school on a dance scholarship. I won all these awards at, at, you know, and, and all these different things that I was hoping for. I immediately, um, as a freshman, as an 18-year-old, um, started dating someone that ended up being an NFL quarterback that year. And so my life ended up going into this whole NFL world, an NFL scene. And I was, I was swept into success. I was swept into the, the, the idea of what the world called success. But I was very empty, and I knew it. And the reason I knew it is because I kept making decisions that made me feel emptier and emptier. I, I had enough church background to know what was right and wrong, but I didn't have the relationship to help me to really be free. Until I was in my apartment. There's a party in my own apartment. <laughs> and, and, and the Holy Spirit, now I have language to say it, but the Holy Spirit came in in that moment and opened up my eyes. And I looked around and I thought, oh my goodness, like, I don't want to be, this isn't who I want to be. Who, what am I doing? So I called my friend Lisa. Lisa was a girl that I knew from high school. Lisa was a prayer warrior. Now, I didn't know that at the time. All I knew is that Lisa would leave notes on my car. And she, we were both at the, at the same school. And she would leave notes on my car, and she would say, praying for you, saw you dance, proud of you. You know, it was just that kind of, like, little notes where I knew she loved God, and I knew she was there. She was just there for me. So when the Holy Spirit came into my, my apartment that night, all I knew is, I got to call Lisa. Maybe she'll come and just pick me up. I got to get out of here. So Lisa came. She picked me up. We drove around, and I just started confessing. I wasn't thinking, I need to confess my sin, and I wasn't thinking that at all. I was just more like, I just want to be clean and free. You know, that was my desire. So I told Lisa all the stuff, and at the end of that night, Lisa just said something I, I really won't forget. She was so wise. She simply said to me, uh, that, that exchange of stuff, like the grace of God is enough for you, but you have to be able to open up your hands and exchange. If he asks you for maybe whatever he asks you for, you, you have to have open hands to give it. And so I was like, like what? And, you know, like, like what are we talking about here? And she was like, you know, the, your relationship, um, you know, with this NFL quarterback. And I was like, no. Uh, no, that was my trajectory. That's what we were going to get married. We had all these plans. And so I left that night in the balance. Of, it was like a decision balance. It was that place of, do I want worldly success but emptiness inside? Or am I going to choose freedom from myself and freedom from the guilt and the shame and all that if it may cost me something that I hold dear? And so all of that being said, about two weeks later, Lisa said, Lisa called me, and I, and I was two weeks of torment, because I knew what I was, I knew the decision was in my hand. So the two, the two weeks after that, um, Lisa invited me to a Good Friday service in our hometown. Went to a Good Friday service, and the Lord captured my heart in such a way that was so real and so precious. It wasn't something that any person orchestrated or demonstrated, but here's what was beautiful about that moment is it was a community gathering. It was in the, at the Woodlands Pavilion, and it was a community-wide Good Friday service gathering. It was open to the whole community, and they held just worship and teaching, and they had a little video, and that night, Jesus himself came, and he washed me clean, and he freed me from my sin and myself, and it was a definite black-to-white moment, and I'm, I've never been the same since. So in that moment, I knew everything was going to be different, and that was in 1998. So it's been 21 years ago, and it's been, it's never gone back. It's never been the same. So I will tell you, in that, in that time frame of Good Friday to 2019, here's what I have known God to be. He is always who he says he is. He always is. 
And there's something that's crazy. I have gone through lots of these. Not, not, not in my faith of like, I believe God, I don't believe anymore. It's not like that. I've gone through high moments. I mean, you guys know, right? Y'all are alive on the earth. <laughs> we, go, we go through peaks and we go through valleys. But God is the same and he never changes. So a couple little nuggets of my history from 1998 to now is... I didn't marry that NFL quarterback, and I'm so thankful. <laughs> I actually walked in this free place of living a life that Jesus had for me that I never even dreamed of. I didn't know what it felt like to have a pure heart and a clean hands. I didn't even know, but when I felt it, I never wanted to give it up. I never wanted to grab hold of anything that would change that place. And when I started to walk in places where I started to feel, ugh, that, that, saint, that precious Holy Spirit, the filling up of the Holy Spirit that sealed my heart that night at the Good Friday service came and empowered me to choose life, to choose other areas, to choose God's ways and not my own anymore. So a little nuggets. I did get married to a wonderful man and we met at a Christian sports camp. Um, we got married and then we struggled with infertility and I really longed to be a mom. Something that the enemy... Um, really one, when I was not a believer, I had had an abortion in the, that time in college. And so when I became a believer, the Lord washed me clean, and I knew it, and I was free. But in those four years of waiting and infertility, I was like, oh, is this like punishment? Or is this some way? And do you know what I had to do over and over and over again? Open up the Word of God and remember who he says I am, that my sins are separated as far as the east is from the west, and that he does not hold his, my sin against me anymore. Jesus took it on the cross. So I am not bearing the, the, the punishment anymore. So there was no punishment. So I had to wrestle and fight the enemy in those spaces. But I'll tell you this, this is the beautiful part. The more I declared in my infertility, in my years of infertility, the more I declared who God was in those spaces of freedom, of peace, of purity, of healing, of absolute redemption, because our God is a God of redemption. He redeems everything. He does not ever let the enemy hold one place without redeeming it. Even though we might not feel it in the moment or understand how he's going to do it, he redeems it all. I had to stand in that place knowing the deepest longing of my heart was to be a mom, and I wasn't a mom yet. And so we had community around us. How many of you guys know you need community around you <laughs> to help carry you some of those longings and all those places? We just need people that can believe God with us and hold our hands up, hold our feet steady on faith. So we had community around us, and you guys, I'm talking the church, they would lay hands on me Oh, all the time. Pray, 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 pray. Believe, believe, believe. Month after month, you know, just no baby yet until it was wonderful. The biggest surprise happened, and it really was a surprise. Just one January, we found out that we were pregnant with my oldest, Jada. And so we have four kids now. We have Jada, Kiva, Judson, and Kaysen. They are the biggest gifts, and every single one of them was a, oh my goodness, look, we did it. We get another one. You know, like this is so great. We did have a baby in between my daughters. So it was Jada, Mia, and then Kiva. And our Mia, we lost when she was about 28 weeks. I was 28 weeks pregnant. And it was, again, another blow in my heart of like, ugh. But here's the most beautiful part, is that the Lord took that and he even redeemed that, and still is. So our Mia, when I was grieving the loss of Mia, grieving the loss of Mia, what the Lord spoke very clearly is that what he wants is sons and daughters. It was as if he was help let, allowing me into the places and spaces of his heart. Here's what I mean. I was out at the cemetery, and I was grieving. And I was like, Lord, like, why? You know, that, you know the, the grief of the wrestle. You know, it's not like you we're going to know why all the time. That's for sure. But in the grief, you ask, and you wrestle, and you do that. And while I was out there, it was as if I could sense the Lord weeping with me, going, this is my heart. When I look at the earth, you know the longing of my heart. I want sons. I want daughters. And you, that longing that you're feeling right now, I share. 
I share that longing. We had that longing together. He wanted sons and he wants daughters. Not, he doesn't want servants and slaves. He wants to hold and experience and live and, and, and have shared experiences together. That's the kind of father that he is. And so he had gave me that perspective and, and that shared heart with him. And so with that, I felt like, oh, now I'm starting to understand God's dreams. Now I'm starting to understand God's dreams. God's heart is so big. His longing is to have that relationship, just like I experienced after I had been in lots of Bible studies or lots of Sunday school classes or lots of Christian. But when I had the relational experience with God, it was so different, radically different than just doing the right things, serving him, doing what he he, he likes, he actually just wants to relate. He wants to know, that he, he wants us to dialogue and communicate. So he did share something from his heart with me, and that's how UR Conference began. Um, UR Conference began through a vision and a dream of his heart, and it was actually a, a seeing a picture through the scriptures and through a time in prayer <laughs> that the Lord began speaking how he wants his daughters and sons to come together and worship him so that we can really be free. You know, y'all know this is a little blip in eternity right now, right? It is. We, we know this is a little blip in eternity for right now. And so we've got all forever eternity ahead of us, and we have all this time that's been passed. And right now there's this great cloud of witnesses right now. Some of, some of the people that we love the most are there already, cheering us on in, the, in Hebrews 11 and 12. They're cheering us on to run our race strong. And so what the Lord gave me is, oh my goodness, the people right now on the planet, we're really close in age. Like the 85-year-old women and me at the time who was 35, I guess, like we are actually really close together and we need to hold hands and we need to link arms because the 85-year-old women that have seen and experienced things that I have not yet, I need them. I need their wisdom. I want them. I want their humor. I want their understanding that I have not yet experienced. And you know what else I really want? I want to hold hands with the little kids that are full of faith and are childlike and that can keep me not thinking too much of myself. <laughs> you know, thinking too hard about things that I can think too hard about. I need, I need all of the generations coming together. So I'm a crier, I'm not gonna apologize. So, <laughs> so the Lord showed me this picture of what it would look like if we came together. How much better and stronger his church is, built brick upon brick brick upon brick, building his church, we cannot build it without each other. And I mean that we can't build it without white people and Hispanic and black. We can't do it without each other. We can't do it without, without Methodist and Baptist and Catholic and Episcopal. And you just go across. We need everybody. We need the whole expression of God's heart. And that's what I started to understand that day out at the cemetery is God's heart is for his sons and his daughters on the planet men and women to have connection and real relationship with him. And he wants us to know his heart too. He wants to be able to share his secrets with us. He has things that he wants to share with us if we just slow down and listen. And so that's that little nugget and that's, that's that little portion of, of my heart. I'm gonna tag Ash and now she's gonna go from her, her perspective. Um, yeah, so I am super, super excited to be with you guys today too and just wanna briefly share a little bit of my story I am much younger than Steph, so it's shorter. So, um, just kidding, just kidding. Um, but I, um, unlike Steph, grew up in a really solid Christian home, and um, my mom actually was the first believer on her side of the family, minus a great aunt somewhere um, that was a praying woman that I really do had a, believe had effects on my mom becoming a believer. So when I was a baby, my mom started really walking with the Lord, and. My dad had grown up in the church enough to know like, who God was, that, that Jesus was the way um, for us to be married, made right with God. But when he saw my mom reading her Bible and highlighting and learning and growing, he kind of stepped up at that point too. Um, and so for me, as I was growing up physically, I really believe my parents were growing up spiritually. And so all I've ever known were parents that really loved God. And I just even want to pause for a second and just say if any of you 
Um, maybe the first believers in your family, um, just keep going, keep praying. I, I am amazed when I look at what God's done in one generation of somebody saying yes. Um, my mom had no idea what her daughters were going to be able to do for the Lord. And so I just want to encourage you that um, generational blessing is real. And when you say yes to the Lord, he really will honor that. And um, I'm so grateful for my mom and all the ways that she has paved um, for us to get to walk in that faithfulness. And so... I grew up really knowing the Lord from an early age, and um, about six years old, gave my heart to Christ and the best that I knew. I knew that He was the only way I really did desire to know Him, and um, my mom even talks about how she's like, you were a crazy liar until that point, and then you started telling the truth. And so I was like, well, that's good. Like, I have my little before and after, even though I was six. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I just kind of grew up knowing and loving Jesus, and middle school really wrestled through, am I really a believer? And I'm pretty deep thinker and definitely was still in, in middle school too. And so I just began to wrestle. Do I really believe who God is? Or is this just because I've grown up this way? And all of that. And I remember a moment where I went to speak to my youth pastor's wife and just told her what I was wrestling through. Like, yeah, I don't know if I'm really a Christian. I don't, how do you know that you know that you know? And um, she just looked at me and same thing, God just in his kindness gives us people that can speak wisdom straight to us. And she's like, Ash, I mean, that's really between you and the Lord. Um, it seems like there's spirit, um, evident, uh, fruit of the spirit that's really evident in your life. So sometimes when we're feeling that tension, it's God just really inviting us to go deeper with him. And it was like a light bulb went off, and I really, for the first time, really understood how God wants deep relationship with us, friendship with us, and it kind of moved from my head to my heart at that point. And I remember kind of hungering to read the scriptures and to be around other believers and kind of went into high school really with a major heart change. I was reading and just loving the, the Word of God, and I remember being on my floor as a high school student, reading about the apostles and how they were considering it glory to be suffering for Christ and weeping because I wasn't like that and um, really wanted to have a heart like that that cared for people and for the gospel like that and um, even kind of out throughout high school that was when the Lord started teaching me about even just confessing sin and community and friendship and still have some of my closest friends from high school today that are walking with me and walking with the Lord too. And so launched into college at Texas A&M in 2006 to pursue a marketing degree. I wanted to work in retail and fashion merchandising, and that was my goal. I had hookups at Neiman's, and I was like the nerdy freshman going to the career fair, like they were gonna know me by the end of my senior year. And uh, my goal was to live in New York City, and my, I mean, it was super weird high school. I knew all this stuff by the time I graduated high school. I wanted to live in New York, and I wanted to work at Bergdorf Goodman, which is a very overpriced department store. And, um, and so that was my goal. Went to college with that in sight. And um, right when I joined, I came to Texas A&M, I joined an organization called Aggie Sisters for Christ. And I ended up leading worship. It's a super long story, but God just kind of opened all of these doors that should not have been opened to me because of my age and where I was in school and ended up leading worship for this organization. Um, and it was a pretty significant organization on campus, had a lot of impact and influence. And really through that, God developed my heart for ministry and for college women in particular. And um, around that time, my sophomore year, I started a, a Christian women's college um, event called Intimacy. And, um, and that really opened my eyes too, to all the things that God had kind of created uh, me to do. So I love being behind the scenes and running organizations and events and hence why I'm part of your conference. And about that time when I started that event is when I started meeting with Steph. Um, so I've known Steph for more than half my life. I realized that a couple weeks ago, so trippy. Um, but she was a youth group leader of mine in high school for a weekend retreat. Her and her husband came and led this one weekend. I'm from New Braunfels, and um, that's where her husband's from. So they came and led. We really connected. So when I came to A&M, we basically reconnected my sophomore year, and I asked her to mentor me. And I'd seen all of these other girls that were fifth-year seniors, and they all had mentors. I was like, that seems like a really smart idea. I think I'm going to do that. And so I reached out to Steph. Um, thankfully, she said yes. And I really do think that's probably the wisest decision I made in college was putting myself under someone who really loved and was chasing God 
and I would just devour everything I was learning. And we weren't even like sitting down doing Bible studies. We were just in our home changing our kids' diapers and running errands and all of that. But it was really through friendship with her and so many other friends God brought along those years in college that my eyes just opened even more to all that God had um, to offer. And so I continued to be faithful and slowly God really turned my heart from wanting to do um, business and fashion merchandising into ministry. And I thought I was going to be doing music stuff and some different things at the time. But I remember sitting at the foot of my bed, the end of my sophomore year, just weeping and telling the Lord, like, you can have it. I mean, this dream that I've had for years and I'll surrender to you. Whatever you have is better um, for me. And so I just surrendered that to the Lord. Time's up. Um, (laughs) Surrender that um, at that point. And God just continued to open doors for me um, in ministry. And I ended up working at Central Baptist here in town for six years after college as the college women's director there. Loved it. Um, God did so much during that time. And part of that was um, starting UR Conference with Steph. And so It was a really huge season of both of us walking in faith and trusting God to kind of lead this thing and to see it six years later and what God's been doing with it has been really remarkable. Um, But I'll let Steph share a little bit more about that. And um, a big part, I almost forgot, um, four years ago, God uh, began stirring my heart. It's just a transition was coming and began to pray about that. And it's an extremely long story, but God actually ended up leading me to move to New York City. So three years ago today, I moved to Brooklyn, New York, um, really, truly with a heart to love people and live like Jesus there. I did not have a job. Um, It was a pretty crazy story of how I even got there, and I'll share a little bit about that later. But um, I basically, the last three years, have experienced and walked um, living in faith more than I ever have in my whole life. And I have seen... God prove himself over and over and over again. And every time I get to retell some of my stories over the last year, I am amazed at the com- or the phrase that I hear often when I'm speaking or when I'm telling somebody about it is, I prayed this and then God did this. I prayed this and then God did this. And I've just seen really, truly how God responds to faith and how he responds to prayer. And even if it's just a mustard seed, I mean, that's the majority of my time there was this like, this is all I have but I'm going to bring it to you and to see God honor that and bless it. And then um, a little over, a little less than a year ago, um, God began opening doors for me to actually come back here and be full-time working with the conference. And so um, I've lots and lots of stories over the last three years of living in New York, but really excited about what God's doing here. And like I said, I'll share a little bit more about the faith journey of that in a second. All right, how are we doing? Hang, hanging in, so we're, we're tagging. You know, one of the biggest gifts in, uh, in my life has been Ashley and a few other girls alongside her and her age. It's been such a gift to me because they, they, they don't let me slow down in the best way, you know? It's so good. Um, so the last thing I wanted to, the, the, the next part that I really wanted to talk about is really understanding God's dreams and how God thinks. Um, spending time with him in his word and in prayer is the main way to understand who God is and how he speaks. And so one of the, the, the biggest ideas for this time that I was hoping to get to share through this is how he is way bigger and better. Ephesians 3 talks about how he can do so much greater, so, so, so much greater than we can ever even begin to dream and imagine. So I'm a dreamer. I'm a visionary. I love to think through. Charlie is a visionary. So, and we're thankful. We're all here because of that. And I love dreaming big. I love imagining like, okay, like what's this? What's this? And, and, and you guys, God is just beyond our dreams. He's just bigger and better. So a couple little nuggets that I wanted to share. One of the, the dreams in my heart for you, our conference was that generations would come together, that, that literally a grandma and whatever other generation could be in the same space, hold hands and go, let's do this together. And you guys, it has not just happened once. It has happened multiple, multiple, multiple times. There's one precious woman that I love with my whole heart. Her name's Mima, and I love her. She moved here from Louisiana, and she, it's like, I don't don't know how old Mima is, late 70s, mid 70s, I don't even know. But she is on fire, passionately pursuing Jesus, and she's doing now in her life 
things that she never even dreamed of because she's gotten to connect with multiple different women and begin dreaming in ways that she never allowed herself to dream because she was surrounded by different women that had different life experiences. She's seeing needs in, in ways that she's never seen before. Meemaw's just one. She blesses our family so much. There's, a, there's so many women that have come together over the years. A, a, a whole, there's been communities that have begun because of something that God's spoken at, just during a Friday night session. Uh, you are. There are counseling ministries that have begun. There are deep healing from past trauma that have begun because of setting aside a Friday night and a Saturday morning, Saturday day, to meet with the living God because we believe he wants to speak. You are a conference. Is the, the, the word you are is actually about interacting with God. It's not talking about God, but it's talking to him, saying, God, you are bigger and greater than we could ever dream of. You are doing a new thing. You are on the move. Help me to walk with you. you. God, you are full of grace and kindness. I was reading in Ephesians 1 this morning about he is rich, rich, like wealthy, like filthy rich and grace and kindness. Like he looks for ways to give that away, to give it away because it's just flowing out of him. He wants to be kind to us. He wants to give us grace to do more than we can ask or imagine. And so for you, and what I wanted to inspire and really hope to encourage this whole room, if each one of us would take a step in a way that only, if it's only gonna happen if God shows up, he'll do it. And he'll do it in all these other spaces and it'll just be all these things popping up that, that we have to step back and go, only God. Only God could have done that because we didn't know. We, we, part of the UR conference is called, uh, we do these retreats called living room sessions. And it's literally a living room. It's a circle of women that gather. And, and there's no stage, there's no big spotlight, anything like that, but it's a circle of women that gather. And God does the miraculous. I mean, I, every time I've left that, I'm like, I cannot believe that God just did that again. Like he did it again because we show up and we see God. A woman comes, leader, a, a woman comes to attend and God himself connects them with just the right woman on our team that has the just the right word to give them, just the dream that this person had. That, that was a weird dream that I just had. She, they, they meet this person and boom, the Lord is like speaking clearly and inspiring this woman to go and do so just radical things. I mean, it's, it's stuff, you guys, that you can't even explain without stepping back and going, wow, God, wow, God, you are big and you are so encouraging and incredible. Not encouraging, he is encouraging, but incredible, extravagant. That was the word I was looking for. So here's what I wanted to just ask you in these last little minutes, and I'm going to open up the scriptures just to Luke. But I want to talk to you about the posture of God. When you start, when I'm talking about dreaming with God, what, what do you imagine yourself? What is your posture and what is God's posture? When I use that word posture, here's what I mean. Um, when you're imagining going and talking to God about a dream, do you imagine yourself going like this? And like, God, you know, like your posture kind of being sheepish, you know? What's your posture with God? Or are you kind of like, listen, this is what I want. You know, kind of, what's your posture with a living God? The creator God who loves us, who loves you, who redeems your life. What is your posture? Or is it friendship? Can you come here just real quick? Ash and I are friends. I mean, like, I really have known her since she had blonde highlights in her hair and wore, wore Argyle sweaters. So, but I love her so much. But, like, she's my friend, and so I can interact with her without feeling like I have this introduction with her every time. Does that make sense? Like, when I interact with Ash, I'm not like, Hi, it's me again. It's Steph. I have a request. You know, I, that's not how I am with her. I can literally, she knows my voice. She, I don't have to introduce. She knows me. She even knows when I sigh. Like, she knows different sighs because we've spent so much time together, you know? Like, she knows if I'm just like, ah, that's different than, like, you know, it's different. I don't have to say a word and she can go, you okay? Or like, good day stuff? Or she just knows me and I know her. So when Ash calls and she has a different tone of voice, she could be talking to me about something totally different and I stop and I'm like, hey, what's going on? You okay? It's not even really the words, it's her presence, it's her person that I'm familiar with. And how much more, see how I'm interacting with Ash and like loving it. How much more is the living God, like imagine God, this is God himself, the creator God of the whole universe, God himself here and me approaching the one who knows me and loves me and has, and is not ashamed of me, even, even though, fill in the blank, even if he is not, he wants me to be his close daughter. 
And so how much more does God want me to come to him and share with him what's on my heart? Look at him and talk to him. And how much does he have to say about it? Because he created my heart. He created my DNA to be able to good at the, be good at the things on earth that would most glorify him. So he created me. I don't have to like explain myself. You know, like all the disclaimers that sometimes when you're getting to know someone where you're like, so what I don't mean is that I want this. I, or what I don't mean, like you don't have to do that with God. You actually can just talk to him and go, this, this is what's on my heart. And he can interact and we don't have to be afraid to step together in it. Because as we step in friendship with God together, if I'm like running ahead of God, guess what? We're close and I recognize it and I'm like, oh, and I realize I want to be close. I don't want to be far from God. And there's a difference there. Does that make sense? So I wanted to really inspire that in you, like to dream with God, your posture and God's posture. God's posture towards you is he's not ashamed of you and he's not an angry God. This is the last thing I wanted to read before I hand it back to Ash. You guys are familiar with this verse, familiar with this scripture. Can I share something real quick too, Steph? Yeah. Um, even while she was doing that, I was thinking about, there's a verse in Proverbs that talks about the one who conceals his sin, his wrongdoing, the ways that he's um, hurt the Lord, um, does not prosper, but the one who confesses and forsakes his sin obtains mercy. And I think one of the beautiful things about who God is, like where we know we can have that kind of friendship and posture, is the way into relationship with God is through the repentance. And repentance is this turning away from sin, all these other things that I found comfort in, and choosing to turn from that and find comfort in God. Um, you know, in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the whole first half is all of this judgment, like you're doing these things, this is what God's displeased with. And the first turning point is when Isaiah says, comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. And that word in the Hebrew is often interchangeable with the word um, repentance. So you don't often think of comfort when you think of repentance, probably. Like, I think it's uncomfortable. I don't want to tell God all of my junk and all of this stuff, but God really is wanting us to when we think of repentance, to even think of comfort. That I mean, when I've found comfort in my sin and all these other things, I can choose to repent and turn and find my comfort in the Lord. And so even that, like just that that's the start of our relationship with God comes from finding comfort. It is not, we obtain mercy. That, that word in the Hebrew, that mercy is like a, a parent picking up their child with loving compassion and tenderness. And so even that, that's what starts us and launches us in that to be able to have friendship and even be able to dream with the Lord. It's really incredible. Amen. I love that. And I do just want to say, you know, oftentimes it's the things that we want to find comfort in that keep us from that close connection with the Lord. Isn't that right? I mean, if, if you are believers, you all have experienced that. Where we just, it could be busyness. It could be whatever, you know, distraction. It could be social media. It could be lazy. It could be so many different things that keep us from interacting with God that we can find false comfort in. Um, I'm going to read this parable. Some of you guys are familiar with it, I'm sure. But I'm going to read it. Jesus told him this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man set, <coughs> excuse me, sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet. Kill the fattened calf. We must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother's back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We're celebrating, the, we're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in, so his father came out to him. 
and he begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when the son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. It's a good story, just that. If I just left it right there, it's a good, just a good word. But, I, but what I want to pull out on this is really unique, and it's the father's posture both times with both sons. The son, the prodigal son that left and, and squandered his money and his inheritance on wild living, the father's posture was always longing to be connected to that son. The father's posture was looking and waiting. And when he saw from a far distance, when he saw that son, the father ran. He didn't even let the son give like the whole like, sorry, this is why. And can I just come and be a hired servant? He, he didn't even let him say that. He actually just embraced him, made sure he knew he wasn't a servant. He was actually the son. He put a ring and a robe. He had authority. He didn't have to earn it. He just had to turn, just like Ash said. It's that ribbon. It's just turning back to the Father's heart. And he makes it easy on us, doesn't he? He makes it, it's like, oh, I just want you. The Father's heart was always to be connected. And then the son that, was, that had made the good decision to stay close by, but really what we're seeing in his heart is he really didn't want relationship with his father. He wanted what his father had. He wanted the, the gifts that his father had, the inheritance that he had. But actually what we see in this last part is the older, older brother really didn't want to be with his father. He was just mad because this fattened calf that was going to be his is now wasted on his brother. And now he was just wanting to hang out with friends. Listen to this part again. I want to, I want to read it out loud. He says, the older brother was angry. His father came out to him. The older brother was angry, but the father even came out to him. And he begged him to come in. And then the father began saying, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the father says, in all that time, this is what, I'm sorry, this is what the son said. All that time you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. He also wasn't looking for relationship with his father. He wanted to party with his friends and he wanted his father to fund it. Do you see that? What the father wanted every time, both brothers, and what the father wants with all of us is that relational connection. He wants to be close to us. The reason I read that is because this is wild. This father has an inheritance to give away. And do you know that he was happy to give away all that money, all of everything that he'd earned, that father? He was, that, was, that was great, and it was a gift, and that's fun. But actually what the father wanted was relationship. The first thing that the father wanted is to share with his sons, to be connected with his sons. That was the relationship, and that's the same relationship he wants with all of us, to be connected, so that we can dream with the Father. Not, a, not here's my dream, I'm going to go, can you fund what I want to do over here? You know, a lot of times that's what we think that we're supposed to be doing, right? Is, I'm going to go do this, and God, can you just provide so that I can go and do this thing? No, God's saying, of course I can fund what's on my heart. Of course I can give all the resources. He owns a cattle on a thousand hill, every hill. God owns, and he knows how to put the money and the resources and everything just in the right spot to fund the dreams of his heart, right? God knows how to do it. So we are not limited by any of that. What we're limited to is if we are in relationship with the Father. Does that make sense a little bit? Okay, I'm going to kind of jump on with that. So I just, uh, even a personal testimony of um, how I've seen that played out in my life is my story about moving to New York. So about four years ago, um, I was in a phase where I was going into what was going to be my last year um, at the church at that point. I didn't know it. And I was moving into a new apartment and I remember kind of just all of this t season of transition and some of my friends had moved from here and um, this isn't always the most happening place for a single girl in her late 20s and I'm learning not in her early 30s either. Um, but uh, I was kind of going through this transition phase and I remember a few different mentors of mine, one being Steph and another one encouraging me to really dream with the Lord. And when I would hear that phrase, I was actually annoyed because like, it's so trendy. Everybody's saying like, dream with the Lord right now. And what does that even mean? And I'm not a dreamer. Like I am, I can, I have enough vision for sure to catch what other people are wanting to do, but I'm like the girl that builds it and puts feet to it. And 
Um, and so anyways, with that, I remember just kind of sitting with the Lord right after I'd moved into my new place and I was praying over it. And, and I just told the Lord out loud, like, everybody's telling me to dream with you. I don't even know what that means. I don't know how to do that. So here's just three things that are kind of on my heart that I haven't seen you do yet. And I laid out three different things. And the last one I said was, I don't even know if this is okay to have, but if I had a dream church and a dream place to be a part of, I think it would be Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. And as soon as I said it, I was like, that's so weird. I don't even know where that came from. Like, I had followed their ministry for a while, but I'm not like normally like a fangirl with stuff like that. And so I was like, I just, I don't even know where that came from. And I literally went, I'm going to leave that right there. And I walked out of the room. And a few months later, I'm at breakfast with Steph and her husband, Brian, and Steph just encouraged me to send my resume to them. I was like, no way, that's not how that works. I don't even know anybody there. I don't know the name of the young adult pastor, um, all of that. And her husband was like, yeah, that's, that's weird, Steph. Don't do that, Ash. I was like, thank you. And uh, the next week, Brian went to Atlanta for a small gathering, maybe 20 or 30 guys from all over the country. And I get a text from him, and he's like, hey, Ash, I'm having a blast. You'll never guess who was in the car with me from the airport, but the young adult pastor from Brooklyn Tab. And I remember sitting in my office like, what? God just like totally went up to me. This is crazy. And so Brian set up a meeting for me that December when I, was, I had already planned a Christmas vacation with my mom there uh, to see a few shows. And so I went, and I remember just walking around um, downtown Brooklyn before, before my meeting um, with the young adult pastor and praying and like, God, this is so crazy. I prayed one like sentence a few months ago and I'm about to walk into here. I don't even know what you're doing. This is nuts. And I felt like the Lord just said, hey, Ash, this particular thing isn't for you, but this is so that you know that I hear you. It's like loud and clear. I got it. You definitely understand that. And so I meet with them. It's great. I come back here um, that January. It's January of 2016, and I run the conference, and my ministry with college girls is going really great. I'm thriving and growing, and the last thing I wanted to do was leave all that. And I was like, Lord, I'm just going to shelf that. That was kind of a weird um, experience that you did that, but I don't think I'm supposed to go to New York, and, but was still kind of feeling transition in the middle of it. And for the next probably six to eight weeks, January through about April, I felt like every conversation I was having, every sermon I was hearing, everything I was reading was all about living in faith. And every time it was this invitation of God asking me, are you willing to do that? And I was pretty honest with him. I was like, no, that actually sounds pretty awful. I don't want to do that. It sounds very uncomfortable. And, um, and so I just kept praying and praying and praying. And the Lord just did so many different things. Um, through that time of praying for people and um, just kind of some different testimonies of God over and over again, over those few weeks of him asking me, am I willing to do this? He was also proving himself faithful to give me the strength and courage to obey him and through all these different things going on. And so I remember talking to um, a guy who's kind of a spiritual father of both of ours um, and telling him what I was praying through. I was like, David, this is crazy. I don't know. I'm thinking about maybe going to New York. And he read this story to me, which I want to read to you guys, um, and just challenged me to live in faith. And so this is a story by a guy named Reese Howell um, and the Intercessor. But basically, he and his wife were called to be missionaries in Africa, and they only had enough money to make it uh, like one stop on a train to London. And they needed to go all the way and felt like God just said, hey, this is a chance for you to trust me. And so this is what he says. Um, they went back to the station and waited for the train and for God to provide the money for the train. It came time for the train to come in, and they still didn't have the money. The spirit spoke to Reese and asked what he would do if he did have the money, and he replied that he would stand in queue to buy a train ticket. So the spirit told him to go ahead and get in line. Here's what the spirit said to him. Well, are you not preaching that my promises are equal to current coin? You had better take your place in line. So there is nothing he could do except obey. This is how he described what happens next. There were about a dozen people before me. There they were passing by the booking office one by one. The devil kept telling me, now you have only a few people in front of you, and when your turn comes, you will just have to walk through. You preached much about Moses and the Red Sea in front and the Egyptians behind, but now you are the one who is shut in. Yes, shut in, I answered, but like Moses, I'll be gloriously let out. When there are only two before me, a man stepped out of the crowd and said, I'm sorry, I can't wait any longer, but I must open my shop. He said goodbye and put 30 shillings in my hand. It was a most glorious and only a foretaste of what the Lord would do in Africa if we would obey. 
After I had the tickets, the people who came with us to the train began to give gifts to us, but the Lord had held them back until we had been tested. We were singing all the way to London. And so when David told me that, I was like, oh man, I have to go. And, um, and David just looked at me and he's like, Ash, I mean, you got to live like you have the money in your pocket. And to me, it was just this, you know, when you think of faith, I think growing up, you kind of think it's this wishful thinking almost, or it's hopeful. But really, Hebrews 11 says that faith is assurance of what's hoped for. It's not wishful thinking, it's assuredness. And if we're going to live in faith that what we believe God has done and is doing is real, like you have to live as if the money is in your pocket. So I don't know what that is for you. For me, it was, I mean, the money was kind of representative of God's going to provide a job for me, housing, financial. I was on a ministry budget for years, and I'm going to the most expensive city in the world, which it definitely is. And, um, and so for me, the money, if it was as if God was saying, hey, what, what would you need to go there? It was assurance that a job's going to be there, living situation, all of that. And I felt like the Lord was like, well, you need to live as if that's already provided. And I did. I quit my job of six years that I loved, and I moved, and no job. I had some money saved up. That was about it. And God provided miraculously the whole way. A week after I got there, I landed a job with a nonprofit that did ministry training and development for other leaders in the tri-state area. And through that, God just gave me different connections with people in the city that I was sitting down at tables where I'm like, these people have served here for decades. I don't even understand how I'm sitting here with this guy. Um, and just saw God do so much over that year. And then a year after, uh, being there, I felt like the Lord asked me to step out in faith again and quit my job and uh, try to do freelance graphic design and work at my church. And I remember telling the Lord, like, can't we just check off the living in faith thing? I've already done that. We don't need to do that again. And God just continued to say, go for it. And so I did and just continue to see God miraculously provide over the last three years. And then even the way that I've come back here has been through miraculous provision. I met a lady at a random event in New York, actually at Brooklyn Tabernacle. And that opened up a conversation with a woman that worked for an organization that funded Christian ministries and got to see God just provide even through that, through a really gracious grant given to us. And that just opened the way for us to be able to start having a staff and continue to build what God is doing through our conference. And so again, my story is that over and over and over again of asking myself, um, you know, Ash, are you going to truly live like you have the money in your pocket? So I just want to encourage you. I don't know what that is for you. Maybe it's not a job provided. Maybe it's that God really has forgiven you. Um, maybe it's that this person really will be restored back to faith. Maybe you have a wayward child. Maybe you have loss in your family. It's, you know, whatever it is, like, what is that that God's asking you to do? And will you obey him? And will you trust him? And I can absolutely 100% say he is worthy of all of your trust and of every yes that he asks you to give him. Amen. I think we just wanted to close in prayer and just, if, of course, afterwards, if you have any questions or anything you guys want to chat about, we're here. But I would love to just pray that God would fulfill every dream of his heart through each one of us. Does that sound good? Will y'all open up your hands with me and just offer God anything that you are holding on to and just let him fill your hands up with his presence and his joy. So God, thank you. Thank you for the open hands, God, in this space. Thank you, God, that when we open up our hands and loosen our grip, God, to the things that we think are the best, God, that you always give us abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. You are good, you are kind, you are rich in love and mercy. God, thank you for the ways that you pursue each one of our hearts, God. And I pray for this, um, anybody that, that listens to this, watches this, or in this room, God, I ask you, Father, that your dreams, God, before you even form them in the womb, the dreams that you had for each one of our lives, will be fulfilled. And that when we get to meet you on that m amazing day, God, that we would get to look you in the eyes and, um, and really know, God, that, that you did everything that's in your heart through each one of us, God. Give us faith, God. Give us courage and get, help us, God, to stay closely connected with you. We love you. You're a good father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs>